Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm back here. Um, welcome to the Marshall W. Ulrich Planetarium um, and our new free series, Wonderstruck Wednesday. Um, we have a guest speaker tonight, uh, Tom, who is part of the Airhead Astronomical Society. Um, and if you are interested in the AAS, they have their monthly meeting right after the show tonight. So you can always stick around and find out more about that as well. Um, but with that, let me get your slides and stuff up and I can turn it over to you. I'm a member of the Arrowhead Astronomical Society. This is our local Twin Forks Astronomy Club. And as uh, she mentioned, we are going to be having a little short presentation which lasts less than half an hour. And afterwards, we are doing our, our, our monthly club meeting. And you are more than welcome to stay for that if you'd like. Uh, just for so I can see the slides, I'm going to move over to the side of the planetarium here. We'll start our show. Tonight's lecture is going to be Understanding the Night Sky and the Latin Perspective. And before we start that, I just want to clarify one uh, uh, term that we'll be using a lot during this presentation, and that is a measurement of distance, which is the light year. Light year can be very confusing because you hear the term year, and you think it's a measurement of time, but actually it's a measurement of distance. It's the distance that light travels in one year. It's a big number. It's slightly less than six trillion miles. So if you were able to hitch a ride on a photon of light from the sun and hitch that ride for a whole year, you'd be six trillion miles away from the sun in that time. So light year is a measurement of distance. Just to give you a perspective on that, there's another measurement called the astronomical unit, which is the distance from the Earth to the sun. That's 93 million miles. If you think of the uh, distance from the Earth to the Moon, it's 240,000 miles, so you can have an idea of what that perspective is like. But there are 63,000 astronomical units in the one light year. We're talking about vast distances here. Okay? So here is a typical image of the night sky in the summer in northern Minnesota. You're on a lake. There are some lights from the cabins on the lake, but the lake is smooth. There's a little bit of light pollution down in the bottom. See that there? But you're far enough away from the city lights that you get to see what is my favorite object, the Milky Way. This hazy band of light in the south going towards the north. And amateur astronomers, we all have our favorite objects. My favorite object to see in the night sky, actually, it's something you don't need a telescope to see at all. It's the Milky Way. And if I ask you, well, what is the Milky Way? Many of you would say, well, it's our galaxy. And you would be right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this image and we're going to explore this image in more detail. That's what really the purpose of this talk is. If you were to take a picture of the night sky with the Hubble telescope, and this is a deep field view. You would see that the universe is full of galaxies. This is a very, very small image, a very small portion of the night sky. It's about two by two arc seconds across. The moon is about 30, or excuse me, arc minutes across. The moon is about 30 arc minutes across. This is a little tiny square of the sky, one tenth by one tenth of the moon's diameter. Teeming with galaxies. That's everything you see in there, with the exception of two stars, is a galaxy. Estimated that our universe has probably over 100 billion galaxies in it. We live in a universe of galaxies. Here's an image of a galaxy. And inside of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, looks a lot like this. So, what is a galaxy? A galaxy is just a huge collection of stars dust and gas. There's also some dark matter in there, but it's a huge collection of stars, dust, and gas. This is probably what our galaxy looks like. It's a spiral galaxy. There's a 
oblong core, spiral arms extending out, and it's flat. It's like a disc. You know, in the kitchen, you take a plate, take two plates, take one plate, turn it upside down, put it on top of the other plate. That's what the shape of this typical spiral galaxy is. This is a schematic of our Milky Way galaxy, showing an oblong core, spiral arms, and it's thought that our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And when you're out in this portion of the galaxy, away from the central ball, it's very thin, probably about 1,000 light years thick. We are not located in the center of the galaxy. Our solar system is located in one of the spiral arms about halfway out from the center. We're about 26,000 light years away from the center of our galaxy. This is a close-up view of our schematic of what we believe the galaxy looks like and where our solar system is. And this red circle represents the space that's within 2,000 light years of our solar system, the 2,000 light years of the Earth. Okay? And when you look at the night sky, and you see all those bright stars, the vast majority of those stars are all within 2,000 light years of Earth, and many of them are within uh, 500 light years or less. So when you look at the night sky, you see all those numerous stars, you're not seeing the stars far, far away. You're just seeing the neighborhood stars in our particular region of the galaxy. So this kind of brings up the question, well, what is a constellation, which is sort of a recognizable pattern of stars? And so here we have, this is schematic, this is our solar system here, not to scale. And this is the Earth, and the Earth is kind of tilted. 23 degrees with the of its orbit, and now the axis of our rotation points to a portion of the sky called the North Celestial Pole. And you'll recall that Polaris, the North Star, is very close to that. And so whenever you see Polaris, you can see that you know which direction north is. Okay? And this is just a little dipper in Ursa Minor. And if you were to look at that in more detail, you can see that. It's actually a grouping of stars at varying distances from Earth. While Polaris is about 430 light years away, you've got stars anywhere from 87 or less than 100 to a little over 450 light years away. If we were to move, say, 10, 20, 30 light years in this direction, to the right, for example, that pattern of stars is completely changed. You no longer see a little different. Okay? So all the patterns that we see in the night sky, the constellations, the asterisms, and so on and so forth, it's all dependent upon the fact that where we're located in our particular portion of the galaxy and the neighborhood stars that we see. Go so 100 light years in another direction, you would not be seeing the same pattern of stars in the night sky. Here's just another uh, image of two constellations. This is the Colonial Borealis, the northern crown, and this is the Houthis, the herdsman. And I'll show that picture with more typical constellation type drawing. And you can take just a couple of stars here. Here's Arcturus, which is about 37 light years away. And then the car, which is 225 light years away. If we were in a spaceship, we would just say, let's blast off and go real quickly to the car. You would see Arcturus just whiz right, you would go right by it. And you would no longer have this constellation. So we'll go back to this image again. So when you look at this image and you're seeing all these stars, the stars that you can see with your eyes are our neighborhood stars. And down here I put lines for the constellation Sagittarius, because in this image it's kind of hard to make out the individual uh, bright stars. And that points to 
in the direction towards the center of our galaxy. And then we have a very common asteroid in the summer triangle, which is made up, this is Vega, Altair, and Dena. And Vega is about uh, 25 light years away, Altair is about 17, and Dena is about 1,500 light years away. Now the next question that sort of comes up is, well, why is the Milky Way a band? Why is it like circular shape and so on? And recall we said that we live in a spiral galaxy. And the spiral galaxy is flat and shaped like a disk. And we're embedded in that disk. So as we look through the plane of our galaxy, we're going to see more and more stars and if we were looking, say, 90 degrees to up or 90 degrees down from this plane. And as we see all those stars, and we can no longer resolve those stars as individual, point, individual points of light. And so we see them as a misty cloud. And we see it as a band. As a matter of fact, if you were in really dark skies and could go both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, as you can see the whole, all of the expanse of the Milky Way, you would see that the Milky Way actually is a band that is a 360 degree circle around the, like, around the sky. Okay? And that's just because we're embedded in that disk. And it's brightest where we look towards the center, but also when we look away from the center, which would be both the right and left of this field of this image, we would also see that band. And as an amateur astronomer, if you go out to really dark skies, you can appreciate the Milky Way going beyond, for example, you think about all this being very bright towards the south. But you can actually appreciate in summer, for example, the Milky Way going all the way over into the north. Okay, if you get the dark enough skies. Now another thing that's very interesting about the Milky Way is we see all these sort of dark patches. And you know, the question comes in, sort of what are we looking at there? Right? And if you look at galaxies, and on galaxies, you see similar dark bands. And so what are we looking at there? This is gas and dust that's blocking the view of the background stars. And so the space between the stars contains what we call the interstellar medium, and there's gas and dust there. And when we talk about the dust, it's not like the dust bundles you find under your bed. When astronomers talk about dust, they're talking about very fine granular material, particulate matter, sort of like what you see in the smoke. Okay? And even though space is a vacuum over great distances, like light years, those that particular dust will actually block light. Here's another view. Same galaxy, showing in more detail all the gas and dust that's blocking the starlight. And so when we look in the plane of our galaxy, we're seeing those neighborhood stars, which are very, very bright. We're also looking towards the spiral arms, and we're seeing intervening dust. And that intervening dust is what is making this dark. So this is not an area where it's void of stars. We're actually seeing interstellar dust and gas. We actually look at that. So in this view here, we're looking towards the center. And we'll be a little bit towards the left. So let's go back and show you on that all night sky survey here, 360 degree panorama. That image is looking at the, towards the center of the galaxy, looking about 90 degrees off towards here. That's what that picture is encompassing, that portion of the Milky Way. We can't see all of the Milky Way from the northern hemisphere, and neither from the southern hemisphere can see all of the Milky Way from falling up north and south. We can't see this portion of the Milky Way. That's blocked by the southern hemisphere. But if you get to just a little bit below the equator in the south, the core of the galaxy is straight overhead, and boy, do you get a view of the Milky Way. It's unbelievable. I've never done that, 
I've talked to people, I've talked to a person, for example, who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and was at 17,000 feet on a dark night and said it's like almost as well touched the Milky Way. It was that dark. Very, very nice. Can I ask a question? Yes. Now, it looks to me like it's like a flat galaxy. Is that how all galaxies are? Nope. There's elliptical galaxies, which uh, are much more oval and round. And so then, then they have planets that are rotating, not in kind of the same plane. Oh, yeah. So the stars, yeah. So the stars and solar systems in our galaxy kind of rotate in the same plane. Uh, in an elliptical galaxy, if there were planets, uh, if solar system stars like that, I'm assuming they're orbiting around the center of the gravitational center of the galaxy in a whole bunch of different directions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do they know what causes that? That gets into galaxy evolution. And Jessica, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. What they believe the elliptical galaxy formation is? I, I can't answer that one. Um, so, sorry, I'm adjusting the volume on our stream. Um, so there's two ways. Um, the main way that really big elliptical galaxies form is when two galaxies collide and merge together. That disrupts the orbits of the stars and jumbles them up, and so they're no longer all you know, along the same plane, and the resulting galaxy is an elliptical galaxy. Um, but there is evidence that um, when galaxies first started forming, elliptical galaxies did form along with spiral galaxies just straight out. And that seems to be from how quickly a galaxy uses up its gas to form stars. If it uses that gas up very quickly to form stars, then it is it becomes an elliptical because the stars form before the gas is able to collapse into a disk. Um, otherwise, if it's slower and that gas then collapses into a disk, you end up with a spiral galaxy. Very, very quick uh, galaxy evolution yep. lesson there. <laughs> Jessica, you have it on hold. Oh, go. So, when you look at this image now, you understand why the Milky Way is like a band. You understand the dark cloud. You understand the name of the stars. Let's just talk a little bit about, very briefly, about well, what is going on up there. And this is a schematic of cosmic evolution, starting with the Big Bang to the present. Our universe, all the evidence points to this amazing fact the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and it started as this it's minute, very hot, point like entity of energy and mass, and that gave rise to our universe. It, it's a, it sounds crazy when you hear it when you first hear that, but there's really good scientific evidence again and again and again. To point to this idea that there really was a big bang, which is actually what happened. For our purposes, at the beginning of the big bang, there was really just hydrogen and helium. And you probably remember the periodic table of the elements, or those of you who are very young, you will learn about this in school. And here's hydrogen and here's helium. And at the very beginning of the universe, there's a little bit of hydrogen, there's hydrogen, there's helium, less and more hydrogen, helium, a little tiny amount of lithium, and all the other elements were not there. No carbon, no oxygen, no nitrogen, no iron, no gold, no silver. Where did those elements come from? Well, they come from the stars. And this is probably one of the most significant astrophysics or physics papers written in the uh, latter half of the 20th century, Synthesis of the Elements of the Stars in October 1957. And we'll just spend a little bit of time looking at this, but it's the stars that make those heavier elements. So very early on, we start with the stellar nebula, this interstellar medium, which is just hydrogen and helium, and through the gravitational collapse, you get this tremendous pressure and temperature so great that the hydrogen can start to fuse into more helium. And when that happens, a small amount of matter is lost and it's converted into energy. And it's a phenomenal amount of energy. And so stars that are glowing balls of gas that are undergoing nuclear fusion, 
using atoms together to make heavier elements. And once the stars start to use up all of their hydrogen, the outer layers of the star will swell up, creating what we call giant stars, and the cores will collapse, and the helium that's made will now start to fuse into heavier elements. And so like in our solar enough for a sun-like mass star, you probably can get to carbon and oxygen. But for larger stars, more massive stars, we get the heavier elements all the way down to iron. And then once that happens, you can't combine iron or fuse iron into heavier elements and get energy out of it. And so the star basically the gravitation collapse occurs. It used up all its nuclear fuel. And then you get exotic things like supernova, neutron stars, black holes. Our star will probably just become, will expel its outer shell of gas when this occurs, and giving this little core that we call a white dwarf. Okay? But it's this process of life and death of stars that is making the elements. And while our star will last a long time, probably about 10 billion years, these massive stars actually at a relative scale have very short lifespans. Spans in the order of millions to tens of millions of years. And so they're going through this cycle very quickly. And every time when the star dies, it's expelling heavier elements into this dust and gas. And so then the cycle repeats itself. And now you're getting stars that are not only made of hydrogen and helium, but also heavier elements. But you're also getting disks of material around those stars, which have the uh, potential to become planets. And so you can take a look, and we won't go into the details of this, but there's a periodic table. You can actually look at the periodic table in the sense of where did those elements come from? So you know, here's our hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, but then all the other elements are being derived by what's going on in stars, the life cycle of stars. So what's really fun about being an amateur astronomer and, and a professional astronomer is that you get to study all this stuff. As amateurs, we get to see this stuff. So I'll just show you a few selected objects here just to show you that it's really, really fun. So this is the Ray Nebula. It's called, it's a planetary nebula. This is probably what's going to happen billions of years from now when our sun burns up all of its hydrogen and, and dies. It will throw off a shell of gas, leaving behind a small white dwarf star, which then will illuminate that gas. And this is one of my favorite objects. My favorite object for amateur astronomers. You can see this object very easily, even with modest scopes. And uh, the, the, the central star is difficult to see. You need a, a fairly large telescope uh, to see it uh, with steady skies and high power. But it can be done. But uh, what, what I'm so fond about this uh, object is this is the object that got me less of an astrophotography. If I took one image of this nebula, I'm going to do two minutes exposure time. And that's difficult to see central star just pop right out. And I just said, wow, that's amazing. It's just modest equipment. I can see that just using my, you know, my own equipment with very uh, minimal effort. And that really got me going to watch the car. Here is a object called M1, the Crab Nebula. The M comes from the designation from a fellow by the name of Messier, who was a uh, French uh, comet hunter in the 1700s, and he would identify these fuzzy objects, which he wanted to make sure he didn't confuse them with comets, so he kept a register of these fuzzy objects that don't move, they're not comets. And he didn't realize it at the time, but he was actually keeping a registry of some of the greatest, or the best that deep sky objects to see. This is what we call a supernova ring. This was not here 2,000 years ago. In the year 1054, Chinese astronomers identified a supernova in our galaxy. And this is the remnant of that supernova with expanding gas which is being illuminated by the star. And supernovas are really kind of fun to see. In our galaxy, the 
The last supernova that we saw that was within our galaxy was about uh, 400 years ago. And a galaxy of our size should have one or two supernovas every century. And so there have been supernovas probably going off in our galaxy. We can't see them because we're embedded in that plane with all that gas and dust there. It could be occurring on the other side of our galaxy. We would not see them. Okay? But one of the fun things you can do as an astronomer, of course, is you look at all the other galaxies. There's 100 billion galaxies out there. And every year, astronomers in other galaxies see probably several hundred supernovas. And like right now, for example, in the M101, which is a messy designated object, it's actually a, it's called a pinwheel galaxy. It's located in the Big Dipper, or Earth constellation Ursa Major. And with a reasonable size telescope, you can actually see a supernova occurring in that galaxy. In my experience as an amateur astronomer, we're speaking of supernovas that are easily seen with telescopes. Uh, there are two other galaxies in uh, uh, Ursa Major that I've also seen uh, supernovas in. Uh, so I've seen like three supernovas just in my lifetime in those different galaxies. That's just kind of a fun thing you can do. Anybody here not a member of the club know what this constellation is? Anybody know? Yeah? A bunny. A bunny. It could be. This is very interesting about constellations. Constellations actually are patterns that we see, but they're, they pertain to our culture. Okay, so a lot of we, a lot of constellations that we uh, 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 describe are actually from Greek and uh, Roman mythology. Okay, so this is actually Orion, the constellation Orion, the hunter, and other constellations, other cultures would have different names for this. For example, indigenous people have look at this constellation differently than the way we do. And that's kind of a fun area if you're ever interested in this sort of study. You can look at how different cultures look at the night sky. That's actually a very fun uh, uh, thing to do. But when you look at this constellation of Lion, you see a belt and a sword hanging down. And one of the things you'll see is a fuzzy light in that, in that sword. And that is the Great Orion Nebula. And this is a reflection nebula on this side, which actually is a different number, but this is the great nebula M42. And it is glowing because the stars embedded in this light area here that are actually causing the gas to coalesce. That's an example of an emission nebula very easily seen with both the naked eye, but also with binoculars and telescopes. It looks great. And when you take the Hubble Space Telescope and look at that, in there, you can actually see out of that gas and dust, solar systems being, or star systems being formed. So these are stars, and you've got disks of gas around it, and who knows, maybe we're getting planets around something. And I believe uh, Jessica Bobkin gave a lecture previously about who you know? Last week. Yep, last week on all the number of planets now that we have discovered orbiting stars. So we take a look at this image now in more detail and understand the neighborhood stars. We understand why the Milky Way is band like. We understand that we see this in these dark lanes, and it's not that we're missing something, we're actually seeing something we see in those dark lanes. It's interstellar dust and gas. It's what we are made of. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. What was that? There's carbon, oxygen, nitrogen in that gas, and it's going to form solar systems and planets and so on and so forth, and that's what we're made of. And so uh, uh, it's my favorite, favorite object because it really shows sort of your place in the universe. And I'm going to leave you with just one other uh, way to enjoy the Milky Way. I think that everyone, you need to do this at least once in your life. And it'll really give you a great climate perspective. So if it's like late July, the center of our galaxy will be low in the south, where uh, Sagittarius, the constellation, is. This will be arcing up almost towards the zenith. And what you want to do 
is go to a flat place, either with a lawn chair or just put a blanket down on the ground, lay on the ground, put your feet, you know, put your body perpendicular to the plane of our galaxy. So put your feet in an east to southeast direction, put your head in a west northwest direction, and you'll be perpendicular to this and enjoy the view. But what you'll start to appreciate is from your right shoulder to your left shoulder and beyond is the plane of the galaxy. You'll look above the plane, see fewer stars, below fewer stars, near the plane, more and more stars. You appreciate this glow, and after a while, you won't even think you're on Earth anymore. When you say you're thinking, I'm just floating in space, I'm just floating in the galaxy, this is where I am. So that's it for this uh, presentation. If there are any questions, uh, we'll take them now. And that includes for our viewers online, too. If you have questions, um, you can type them in the comments. So how many of you want to pronounce the way that one? Anybody? You got to do it. I, it, it was a real aha moment for me. I remember I was doing a lot of dark sky stuff. So I was in a very, very dark place. And I was kind of tired. I was looking through the telescope all the time. And we are on a platform. It was fairly large. Deck. Finally, I said, I'm just going to lie down there. I wasn't even really thinking about it. I just kind of lean back like that. I just happened to be oriented the right way. And I was just like, ah, I finally did it. I really felt like I was floating in space. It's a great experience. Starly? Yes. Yeah, you know, this image. I'll tell you how this image was taken. This is, this is actually a three minute exposure. Okay? I was using a tracking mount, but actually it was a manual tracking mount where you actually just kind of turn the screw and stuff like that. With all the Starlink satellites out there, I don't think I'd get this picture. Because it was invariably there'd be a, a, a bunch of satellites kind of coming through and taking speeds. Yep, yep. Very, very important. Jessica, any questions from the. Uh, Audience? No questions, but got oh. a lot of great jobs. Okay, very good. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. So the question is: the core of the galaxy is brighter because there's more concentration of stars. My understanding is that yes, that is correct. Yes. Yep. Jesse, do I have that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you yeah. know, like in Star Trek, they talk about going warp five, and you know what? When you were mentioning all of the distances of the different places, and I was like thinking, well, you know, the rule is we can't go any faster than the speed of light because we probably can't even go that fast. Yep. So the possibility of us being in kind of an ever evolving to the level of Star Trek just doesn't seem real. I mean, it really, I mean, it would take us so long to travel. That it would be just, um, it's really not meant for people to do it. It just seems like we're going to send out probes and, and hopefully they can communicate back to us. Yeah. I mean, it, sort of the conventional kind of thinking is that, yeah, we can't go faster than the speed of light. But is there a way around that with some new physics and so on and so forth? That's going to be an exciting area. And Jessica, I think there are some. Every once in a while, there are sort of articles coming out where people kind of probe that possibility of faster than light travel. Right? Yeah, there there are lots of ideas. Um, nothing that has been done more than just kind of thought experiments. Yep. Um, but I mean, that's that's the fiction part of science fiction, right? If you want to get an interesting, cool story, wandering planetary systems. You got to get around that, and that's why they come up with things like warp drive, so that they can explain traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, whether that is possible, we we don't know yet. There are ideas on how we could possibly make that happen, um, but I'm going to use this as a shameless plug for a show we're going to do next month, where we're actually going to look at things like the science in Star Wars and see what is actually plausible and what is complete fiction. So if you're interested. We'll have that next month. Cool. Very good. But, you know, also, too, it's 
you were talking about fusion, and that's kind of like the, the, the speed of tra uh, light travel thing. You know, you know, if we can figure out fusion, I bet you any money we can figure out how to go faster than the speed of light. That's my guess. I, it just it just seems unbelievable that the sun can last as long as it does. You know, the, the, it's it's kind of like beyond the physics that we understand. Well, actually, we do have a good, pretty good idea of why the sun uh, can last as long as it does. And, uh, and and actually, the history of our understanding of the sun and how it could emit so much radiation is actually a fun way. Uh, 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 to sort of learn about astronomy. And I mean, there was sort of this idea that, oh, it was just, uh, you know, collapsing. And it's just this gravitational collapse that's generating all this. Then there's this little equation called E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. It doesn't take a lot of mass to generate a tremendous amount of energy. And that's what's going on in the sun. And that's why it can last so long. So the problem with us recreating fusion isn't not understanding the process, it's getting the conditions needed because you have to have extremely high temperatures and pressures to make the atoms get close enough for fusion to happen. That's where we struggle with and trying to recreate it ourselves in a laboratory. How hot is hot? Uh, well, I mean, center of the sun is 12 million Kelvin? Yeah, like it's like 10, it's like we're in the 10, 12 the million Kelvin, yeah, I mean, we are really hot. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, they, you know, you've heard about fusion power, right? right? Yeah, right. and it's always been like, oh, another 20 years, another 20 years, another 20 years. I mean, I think eventually we're going to get there. So if you were to ask me as a futurist the question, you know, what, what ultimately will be the energy source, uh, I think eventually we'll probably will get to some type of fusion power, which is really creating the sun on Earth. You know, but it's going to be a long time. Soon. We need it for climate change. <laughs> and it definitely helps big time for that. Any other questions? Okay, once again, thank you all for coming and thank you for our interview viewers. All right, we'll see you next week, everyone. Bye.